I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Welcome, honored guests. My name is Wednesday Adams. I live in this house, the Adams Mansion, with the rest of my family. Let me show you around. She went from childhood sweetheart to indie queen with an edge. Christina Ricci has played everything from a murderous child to a murderous adult, while also having to deal with those pesky ghosts and felines and the stress of growing up in the spotlight. Christina Ricci is never afraid to take risky roles. She never really plays a normal person, whatever normal means. But lately it feels like the dog-eat-dog -dog world of the movie industry doesn't really know what to do with her nowadays, or she doesn't know what to do with it. Join me as we reach into the world of Ricci and find out what makes her tick what characters she plays, what society thinks of her films, and what the f happened to her. Because this is what the f happened to Christina Ricci. WTF. But to truly understand what the f happened to Christina Ricci, we must start at the beginning. And the beginning began when she was born on her birthday, 1980, somewhere in California. And while other kids were playing tag with their friends in the streets, young Ricci was making her film debut opposite Cher. Yes, the Cher. Playing her daughter in the 1990 film Mermaids. That doesn't seem to have any mermaids in it. I haven't seen this movie, but I'm guessing that the mermaids are like an allegory, like a metaphor, like symbolic for, like, their emotions? I don't know. Mermaids. Rachel! Then Ricci would play the role that launched her career. At age 11, Wednesday Adams, in the highly successful big screen adaptation of The Adams Family. Snap, snap. Ricci made the role her own by playing the character with an extremely dark and dry sense of humor, showing range that actors three times her age struggle with. But young Christina Ricci did not want to audition for this role because she was tired and grumpy from a day of auditioning for a bunch of other less iconic roles. But her mother convinced her to channel that preteen angst and use it for the character, and the rest is cinema history. The Adams Family movie has generally favorable reviews. Lots of those critics and those, uh, popcorn eaten people, the audience, they all loved the dark sense of humor. It's just what the world needed at that time. 1990. This Adams Family movie is amazing. It's beyond parody. It's like the perfect balance of nostalgia homage and satire. They're making fun of the old TV show while honoring it and becoming its own fresh thing at the same time. It's very hard to do this. Everybody fails at this except for this family of Adams. This Adams Family movie was so successful, pulling in nearly $200 million worldwide just on a $30 million budget. And of course, Paramount wanted a sequel fast, because money. And it's one of those roles that it's just hard to imagine anybody else playing. Christina Ricci was born to play Wednesday Adams. Wednesday Adams is Christina Ricci, even though she insists that she's like a happy, perky person in real life. She made this role her own, probably overshadowing the original Wednesday. No offense to the OG. Are they dead? Does it matter? Then came the year 1993, and of course Christina Ricci would return to her iconic role, of Wednesday Adams for the quickly made Adams Family Values. You gotta pump those things out quick before the interest dies down. And this is actually one of the best sequels of all time. 
as in it really knows how to build off of the first one and become its own thing. It's so good. Playboy, that, that, that magazine, ranked this movie number 15 on its list of 15 sequels that are better than the original. Once again, critics loved this film, once again appreciating the dark humor. Of course, that praise did not translate to box office buckaroos, unfortunately. The film only managed to make $49 million, which sounds like a lot if you don't have $49 million. But the movie did gain a following on home video. And do not underestimate the power of home video, especially in 1993. I know, I was there. Children, why do you hate the baby? We don't hate him. We just want to play with him. Especially his head. Then came 1995, where Christina Ricci would tackle yet another iconic property with Casper, playing a much more light-hearted teenager, compared to Wednesday Adams, who moves into a haunted house that has Casper and Stinky and Fatso and Stretch and Bill Pullman. Now that's a party. And this movie was actually the first movie ever to feature a fully computer-generated character in a leading role. So Christina had the honor of paving the way for human and computer to create beautiful art and cinema. But I really did love this movie as a kid. I think I went and got the, 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 the toys at Pizza Hut or something. And it was just the right amount of scary stuff and funny stuff for my wee little 90s mind. Then came Now and Then. Ricci would go on to play a younger Rosie O'Donnell, Rosie O'Donnell, in the coming of age story Now and Then. All the critics were comparing it to the far superior Stand By Me, yet it still seemed to make a lot of money at the box office, over three times its budget, and has actually in later years gone on to be a much respected female-centric coming of age story. Because apparently girls come of age too. Hey, wormy wormers. No! <laughs> then that year, 1995, which was a really big year for Christina Ricci, it was coming to a close. And she ended that year out with Gold Diggers, the secret of Bear Mountain. Critics really liked the chemistry between the two leads, but audiences did not show up for this one, pulling in just like $6 million, which sounds like a lot if you don't have six million dollars, but it's not a lot in, in, in the Tinseltown money talk. But I actually remember renting this one at Blockbuster. I mean, uh, my, I mean, my little sister rented it, and I just happened to be in the same room for an hour and a half while it was playing on the VCR, so gold diggers. She ain't nothing but a gold digger. You give me money when I'm in need. Then came 1996. Y'all remember 1996? It, it was, it was, it was great. And Christina Ricci started that year off by starring in her Adams Family co-star Angelica Houston's directorial debut, Bastard Out of Carolina, for Showtime. Then she would have a guest spot on The Simpsons as the voice of Erin on episode 25 of season seven. I usually hang out in front. Oh, you like hanging out too? Well, it beats doing stuff. <laughs> yeah, stuff sucks. Then there was that darn remake of That Darn Cat, Ricci's first Disney movie, which would be her last, as the film was a critical and commercial flop, flopping around all over the place, failing to even make $20 million. And I remember my little sister renting this one too, and I just happened to be in the room while it was playing, so yeah. So I watched it, whatever. What's up? Then Christina Ricci would officially shed her child star image by starring in Ang Lee's The Ice Storm. She took the role from Natalie Portman after Natalie Portman's parents thought it was too inappropriate. And that must be pretty inappropriate because Natalie Portman was in like Leon and that, I don't know. It was too provocative for them. But nothing is too provocative for Christina Ricci apparently, even Ang Lee. The film was released independently where it made over $8 million, with critics praising the ensemble cast, 
And Christina Ricci is a part of that ensemble cast, so that's good. If 1997 was the kickoff to Ricci's independent film career, 1998 would be her dominance of it. She began that year, 1998, by starring in The Opposite of Sex. It's a movie for which she scored her first, and only to date, Golden Globe nomination for Best Actress in a Comedy in a Musical. Even though I don't think this is a musical, but you know, you know how the Golden Globes are. As well as an Independent Spirit Award nomination for Best Female Lead. And film critic Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, highly, highly praised Christina Ricci's performance. He stuck his thumbs really, really high up for her. Both of them. Hey, Bible boy, you're not my fucking husband. Now give me my money. And up next was Buffalo 66, the debut film from Vincent Gallo. Love him or hate him. Christina Ricci absolutely hated working with Vincent Gallo, who would berate her on set calling her a puppet who did what she was told, and several members of the cast and crew shared Ricci's hate for Gallo. Many of them have distanced themselves from the film after its release. The film was called self-indulgent by critics, but yet was still praised by many, mostly due to Christina Ricci's amazing performance. And this is one of those love it or hate it kind of movies. I, I don't know, I, I, I find it fascinating. It's like tragically beautiful. What are you doing? What are you doing? What? Ricci would next be seen in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas as the Barbara Streisand-obsessed, LSD-trippin' Lucy. Next on Ricci's filmography, she would venture into voice acting for a small role in Small Soldiers, playing one half of the Gwendy Dolls, opposite Sarah Michelle Gellar. You've been a bad boy, and now you must be punished. Next up was Pecker from legendary, disgusting filmmaker John Waters. Beautifully disgusting. She played the girlfriend to John Connor, I mean, Edward Furlong, who plays Pecker. Ricci said in an interview that she hated working in Baltimore, but that's what happens when you work with John Waters. Baltimore happens. A lot of film critics kept waiting for the film to shock them, because, you know, that's what happens in John Waters' movies. But they were disappointed at this mainstream attempt. It's weird that a movie called Pecker is John Waters' most mainstream attempt. The film made $2.3 million off a $6 million budget. Then she showed up in a movie called I Woke Up Early The Day I Died, playing a role that I'm sure every actress in Hollywood wanted, a teenage hooker. Then came 1999, the final year of that millennium. Ricci starred opposite an ensemble cast in a movie called 200 Cigarettes. The film tanked in theaters with less than $7 million. And those pesky critics did not like this one either. They called it unfunny, and it really sucks to be unfunny. I know. She is having a party, I just need the address. Ricci would end 1999, which is one of the best years for movies ever, by reuniting with her fear and loathing in Las Vegas co-star Johnny Depp in Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow. The film was originally going to be an Edward Scissorhands reunion with Winona Ryder and Johnny Depp, but she turned it down, and Christina stepped in and nailed it. Ricci would win Best Actress from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films, much deserved. This film is terrifying and beautiful. It's it's one of my favorite Tim Burton movies. One of my favorite Christina Ricci movies. And one of my favorite Headless Horseman movies. Critics found the film fun yet disposable. I don't think so. I strongly disagree. But everybody appreciated the dark atmosphere and the visual effects. This movie is a spooky wild ride. Perfectly suited for Tim Burton and perfectly suited for Christina Ricci. Johnny Depp does pretty good, too. The film made over $200 million off a $100 million budget. <laughs> Ricci.
Ricci would kick off the new millennium, the year 2000, by appearing in a music video for Moby. She plays an angelic figure. Y'all remember this one? It's where he's old. Up next, Christina Ricci would appear in Bless the Child, playing a heroin addict. The film was pretty widely panned and actually ranked 29th of the worst reviewed movies of the 2000s. But that didn't matter much to the Blockbuster Entertainment Awards as they gave Christina Ricci the Best Supporting Actress, Suspense, award. Ricci would then appear again with Johnny Depp in a movie called The Man Who Cried. It'll make you cry, even if you're a man. In the year 2001, she would appear in All Over the Guy, and she would fully shed her child star image in Prozac Nation. She just... You know, you wanted me to be everything, and I can't be. I can't be. She would then receive a Teen Choice Award nomination for Choice Actress in a Comedy for a little scene movie called Pumpkin, which has been called a waste of a premise. And the movie only managed to make like $300,000 theatrically. Although in years since its release, it has been reevaluated, and some have called this one of the most underrated films of the decade. So give Pumpkin a chance. Then came a film called Miranda, which the BBC called a soul-sapping stinker. Ouch! And the BBC? They're always right. Then she would take on a hilarious guest spot alongside Tom Green in the show Malcolm in the Middle. She appears in Season 3, Episode 11. I'm Hal. Hi, Hal. Oh, oh, nice. oh, oh. She would next appear in a recurring role on the final season of Ally McBeal. And then there was a horror movie called The Gathering, which earned less than $2 million theatrically and was called A Canned Atrocity. It's atrocious. In 2003, she would star alongside Jason Biggs for a romantic comedy called Anything Else, written and directed by Woody Allen. Critics found the film to just be a recycling of other Woody Allen films. Nothing very fresh. Audiences didn't show up to this one either, making $13 million off an $18 million budget. And I remember seeing this on a Quentin Tarantino favorite movie list one time, and it, it confused me. Oh, yeah, and at the Vatican, all I could think about while we were doing it was how much you would love that ceiling. So I'm back. I'm home because I, I can't live without you. Then Christina Ricci would appear opposite an unrecognizable Charlize Theron in Patty Jenkins' true life serial killer movie, Monster. The film would receive numerous accolades for its star Charlize Theron with Ricci also receiving much praise for her supporting role, even though it's, it's hard to live in the shadow of Charlize Theron's masterful, monstrous performance. Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, particularly praised the performance of Ricci, calling it sublime acting. The MTV Movie Awards would, of course, nominate them for Best Kiss. And oh yeah, uh, Charlize Theron would, would win an Oscar. The film made $58.5 million worldwide off an $8 million budget and has gone down as one of the best films of its time, of its genre. It, it's, it's a truly unforgettable film with two truly unforgettable performances. And yes, like I said, like everybody said, of course she is gonna get overshadowed by Charlize Theron. But this monster would have been nothing without the support of Ricci's powerful performance. My incredible, incredible leading lady, Christina Ricci, who I couldn't have done this film without. You are truly the unsung hero of this film. Then came 2005, where Christina Ricci would find herself guest starring in the very short-lived, very awful spin-off of Friends, Joey, that nobody watched except, like, my mom. She plays his fancy sister in an episode titled Joey and the Fancy Sister. Hey, Mary Teresa! Joey! 
My celebrity brother. Then she would appear in Wes Craven's cursed werewolf film, Cursed. It's an apt title because there were so many production problems leading many to believe that it was cursed. Cursed. There were shooting delays, there were reshoots, and the Weinsteins were involved, so they just f***ed everything up. Christina Ricci would go on to say that Cursed is one of those studio movies that just got horribly screwed up. Everyone pretty much hated the film, many calling it the worst werewolf movie ever made, and the film bombed at the box office. Look at that just awful CGI, oh my god. It's disrespectful to werewolves everywhere. In 2006, Ricci would guest star in two episodes of Grey's Anatomy. She would land an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Guest Actress in a Drama Series. Up next, Ricci would star in Penelope, about a girl born with a pig's nose. The film was praised for its charming cast. It's one of those, like, perfect little quirky vehicles for Christina. She, she, she's really good at these. These are the kind of movies you should be making. I'm not saying you should have a pig nose in every movie, but, well, maybe. Shit! I'm a monster. No, no, you're not. Penelope, no! Christina would then appear in the very controversial, much-discussed film titled Black Snake Moan, opposite Samuel L. Motherfucking Jackson, who has had it with these motherfucking Black Snake Moans on this motherfucking Black Snake Moan movie. And Christina Ricci went all out for Black Snake Moan wearing an actual 40-pound chain during filming, eating garbage food to appear sickly throughout the movie, and she remained half-naked all the time even when the cameras weren't on. Because, you know, it's, it's part of the method, part of the craft. Even though Samuel L. Jackson was constantly yelling, PUT SOME MOTHERFUCKING CLOTHES ON! Although most critics found the film's premise to be outlandish, they felt that the performances made up for that. Ricci and Samuel L. Motherfucking Jackson would reunite again in their next movie, Home of the Brave. Critics found the film enjoyable, but full of cheesy cliches. Then she took a year off in 2007, but would return with a bang, or, or at least try, by starring in Speed Racer. That was supposed to be a big hit, but nobody went to go see it. The film cost $120 million, but only managed to make uh, $95 million. And of course, this is from visionary filmmakers, the Wachowskis. And after The Matrix, everybody was eager to see what they were gonna do next. Cause you know, everybody likes their distinct style. Style is always good to have. And critics absolutely loved the film's visuals and praised the acting, but found the storyline to be scattered. But Christina Ricci had a blast making this film and was really hoping for a sequel. Then she would lend her vocals to the world of the video game in The Legend of Spyro, Dawn of the Dragon. And there was a movie called All's Fair in Love, which is about people falling in love at a renaissance fair. And this movie was only released in regal cinemas and only made like $22,000. But I actually watched this one, and, and it's funny, and, and it's charming. And she actually became romantically involved with her co-star, Owen Benjamin, who's one of those cancelled comedians. But they broke up. All's fair in love. You are in a rather compromising position. You want to spank me? Don't tempt me. Oh! How'd that feel, bad boy? Not bad. You yeah. really got into that one. Up next was after dot life yeah there's a there's a dot in there i'm not sure if you say the dot or if it's just afterlife but but she's in it it's about a woman stuck between the world of the living and the dead and critics found the premise to be intriguing but it did not deliver audiences agreed and it only made three million dollars then she would become an animated wolf in the film alpha and omega critics hated this movie they found the visuals bland because they were. But the movie still managed to make $50 million worldwide off a $20 million budget. Go Alpha, go Omega. 
Then in 2011 came the horribly unfunny Bucky Larson, born to be a star. And this has the honor of being the worst reviewed movie of 2011. In September of 2011, Ricci would tackle her first series regular role in the short-lived Pan Am on ABC. The show was canceled after only 14 episodes due to low ratings, but that was only in the United States. International audiences loved the show, and it won Best Series at the Rose de Tour Awards, the, the, the European Emmys or whatever. Then came the apocalyptic year of 2012, where Ricci would appear in Bel Ami and War Flowers. Then, because money, they made a sequel to that Smurfs movie, and Christina Ricci was in it. And of course, this thing was a massive success, making $348 million worldwide, making this the biggest box office hit for Ricci ever. She would appear next in Around the Block, playing an American drama teacher in Australia. And the film received very positive reviews. Positive reviews are good. Then there was a movie called The Hero of Color City. It's about crayons. And she plays yellow. She was all yellow. Then came Lizzie Borden Took an Axe in 2014. Ricci would star in this Lifetime original movie about Lizzie Borden, the notorious person who in the 1890s was accused of murdering her father and stepmother with an axe. Did she do it? I don't know, I wasn't there. And that film was so well received that Lifetime immediately greenlit a sequel miniseries consisting of eight one-hour episodes called The Lizzie Borden Chronicles. Ricci would receive a Screen Actors Guild nomination for her performance in the miniseries, a SAG. But reviews for the film and the series were mixed, many taking issues with the liberties the story took. But it's a movie, facts don't matter. Yet everybody agrees that this is one of the best performances of Christina Ricci's career. Then there was another TV series, Z. Ricci would play Zelda Fitzgerald, wife of F. Scott Fitzgerald, and this Amazon-produced series was given a second season, yet that was cancelled after one of the producers got hashtag me too'd. So everything was cancelled, which sucks for everybody. You can call me Zelda. Zelda! 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 Since 2016, Ricci has appeared in mostly forgettable projects. Here are some of the projects that you have forgotten. Mothers and Daughters, Distorted, Escaping the Madhouse on Lifetime. 10 Things We Should Do Before We Break Up, Far Away Eyes, and Percy, opposite Christopher Walken. She also appeared in the Quigby horror short series, 50 States of Fright. So she's still doing stuff. There are thousands of people who want to support you. Christina Ricci is truly an actress who carved her own path. She made a name for herself as a child actor who could go toe to toe, head to head with some of the greatest actors of all time, stealing scenes from everybody. And compared to most child stars, she managed to make it out pretty clean and scandal free. Well, as scandal free as you can be in that industry. And of course, as her career went on, she wanted to shed that child star image. She took on more daring adult roles, which earned her much praise and respect in the independent film community. And as she continued, her performances remained strong, but the material surrounding her seemed to suffer, with mixed reviews and a lackluster box office. But she's actually been spending a lot of her time as a national spokesperson for RAIN, Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. She has taken a topic that she cares deeply about, helping abuse survivors, and has used her celebrity power to help bring money and attention to the cause. And Christina Ricci should be very proud of her charity work. She's actually recently gone public about her own experiences with domestic abuse. Here in the States and around the world, people are staying home to try to stay safe from COVID. And that has led to what's being called the pandemic within the pandemic, domestic abuse. One study found a calls to abuse hotlines are now up more than 30%. And actress Christina Ricci says she's one of the victims. Christina Ricci battled the disgusting Holly weird stuff that most young actresses are faced with, but she made it through. And Christina Ricci is thriving. 
just doing her thing. And I hear that Netflix is making a series about Wednesday Adams, but apparently Christina Ricci is not involved. I repeat, Christina Ricci is not involved. And that seems, uh, criminal. So, uh, I'm gonna boycott that until I don't. I think when it comes to Christina Ricci, we are gonna see a huge comeback. Any day now. Her talent is too strong to be hidden away in mediocre projects. And everyone who has ever worked with Christina Ricci has great things to say about her. Except for Vincent Gallo. Perhaps if movies like Speed Racer had lived up to what they were supposed to be, her career would have taken more of a mainstream turn. And to be honest, I'm not really sure I want mainstream Ricci. For my money, there is no better independent film actress than Christina Ricci. And I cannot wait to see what she comes up with next. And that is what the fuck happened to Christina Ricci. I hope you've enjoyed your tour. And I hope you come back and see us again soon. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all your support.